We are continuing in the book of Acts and picking up in chapter 8. I'll be reading from verses 1 through 8. This is God's word. Okay, just as introduction, Stephen has just been killed by stoning. And verse begins, and verse 1 begins, and Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. The word of God. You may be seated. And will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we consider this, your word, and this history of our brothers and sisters in the fledging, the, 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 the budding church in the first century, we pray that we would learn and understand what you have for us from what we see here, for your glory, for your praise, that we might love you more. And that we might represent you to a lost and dying world better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, so Stephen's martyrdom uh, led to a much more vigorous persecution of the Christians who are in Jerusalem. Which is where we've been up through Acts all to this point. And it's interesting, some of that persecution happened at the hands of a man named Saul. A little teaser there. Stay tuned. To escape the persecution, the, uh, the apostles and, and the Jewish believers had to basically go into hiding. The Hellenist Christians, who we read about, uh, lists of them were in uh, the first part of chapter 6. They, they had to leave the city. And Philip was one of the seven who had been mentioned in Acts 6, 1 through 7. And he headed... But to, to the uh, city in Samaria, to the city of Samaria. Now, in the New Testament, we find that the gospel and the Holy Spirit are both inclusive and exclusive. And that's true, and we see here in Acts 8, and throughout the book of Acts, that that's true. But these days in our world, in our land, the, the buzzword has become that we need to be inclusive. Inclusivity is considered a golden virtue in our land. But when you look deeply into the inclusivity police in society, you find a rigid exclusiveness rooted in ideological prejudice. Well, our concern this morning is how the gospel and the Holy Spirit erase ethnic barriers. And so we're in a perfect place for that. Uh, the American Heritage New Dictionary of Cultural Literacy defines ethnicity this way. Ethnicity is defined as identity with or membership in a particular racial, national, or cultural group and observance of that group's customs, beliefs, and language. The Holy Spirit sent Philip to, Samar to, to the Samaritans to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. In other words, the gospel and the spirit are inclusive. The ethnic barrier that was very rigid there has, has, was erased with the exceptions of beliefs. The gospel is a salvation ideology. We know that. 
And that's distinct and exclusive from all the other salvation ideologies out there. And because of the exclusion of the very beliefs, it would be negligent to suggest to you today that although the gospel is one of the most inclusive things there is, it's still got something exclusive about it. So this morning I want us to look and understand from this passage and some others that, we'll, uh, that I'll allude to that there is an, the inclusiveness of the gospel and the spirit. So first is the ex- inclusiveness of the gospel and the spirit. The second is the exclusiveness of the gospel and the spirit. And then third, how the gospel and the spirit erase ethnic barriers and what are some of the implications of that for us this morning. We need to hurry through the first two points, so try to stay engaged if you can. The first point is the inclusiveness of the gospel and the spirit. It, it's, it's so pervasive in the book of Acts that it becomes a sub-theme of the entire book. It begins with the various tongues at Pentecost that we saw, read about in Acts chapter 2. But gospel and spirit inclusivity comes with a symbol clash in Acts chapter 8. Do you know? Do you know about the prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans? Have you learned about that in Sunday school? You won't find a stronger prejudice anywhere in the world. Samaritans were a mixed race. They were part Jew and part Gentile, and so because of that, they were scorned by the Jews, they were scorned by the non-Jews, and it kind of made them hard to deal with, you know? Uh, Most of the Jews viewed them as unclean. They even avoided, uh, the Jews would even, lots of them would even avoid Samaria when they were traveling from the southern area of Judea up to Galilee in the north, and the most direct route was right through Samaria, but they would go around which took a long time. That's how pronounced the prejudice was. John 4, we read about it, uh, the Jewish prejudice against the Samaritans, with the the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. And let me read verses 7 through 9 from John 4. It says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John gives us in a parenthetical statement the explanation of why she asked that question. He says, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So the Jews were prejudiced toward the Samaritans. Take that and and in, 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 in insert that into what's going on here in Acts chapter 8. But the prejudice went the other way as well. In Luke 9, we see uh, this, verses 51 to 53. It says, When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people, the Samaritans, did not receive him because he, his face was set toward Jerusalem. So the prejudice went both ways. Insert all that into our passage today. And we see God sending Philip, by his providence, sending Philip uh, to preach the gospel to this group of people who certainly in Philip's psyche had been brought up going, wait a minute, we don't deal with those people. The gospel and the Holy Spirit take out a big eraser and say, no, that barrier's gone. That barrier's gone. Well, later in Acts 8, later on in this chapter, the Holy Spirit sends Philip in a kind of an uh, interesting way and an interesting event uh, to, to share the gospel, to witness to an Ethiopian man who's been in Jerusalem. I'll cover that more when we get to it. I won't go into all the details. Some fascinating stuff going on here, by the way. Uh, Don't miss it. Um, But this Ethiopian man is heading back home after being in Jerusalem. And uh, he, Philip goes to him and shares the gospel with him, and he believes. Again, the gospel and spirit inclusivity is written all over that event. And in Acts... A little later, in Acts 10 and 11, we read about Cornelius and Peter's dealing with Cornelius. Cornelius 
it, it, Luke goes to great lengths to describe this. He even repeats the story twice. I mean, he could have saved a lot of paper and a lot of time if he just told the story once, but he has to tell it twice in the, the book in order for us to see how important this is. And what's important about it is Luke spent this good deal of time on Cornelius, this Gentile, and his conversion because it highlights the inclusivity of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. That's, that's one of the main points. The ethnic barrier was high and thick between Peter and Cornelius. It was uncrossable. It could not be breached by any human power. And the spirit and the gospel said, boom, and it's gone. And on and on it goes. Throughout the rest of Acts and the New Testament, verifying the inclusiveness of the gospel and the spirit. But the gospel and the spirit are also exclusive. Well, that doesn't sound good. How can that be? Well, in each of, the, in each of these stories of conversion that we've pointed out so far, there is also mentioned baptism. See, the inclusivity is very striking to those who are reading it for the first time. But then there is also this exclusive thing that goes on called baptism. Conversion. Conversion experienced or expressed by baptism in each of these stories is entry into a new, a new citizenship. One that is founded on faith in Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. That is the classic statement of it. John 14, 6, Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is exclusive. Christianity requires that you be converted. Christianity is not universalism. Christianity is more inclusive than any other religion, uh, but it's also exclusive in that you must enter it by faith in Jesus Christ. So, the gospel and the Holy Spirit are both inclusive and exclusive. There's no ethnicity. There's no corner of humanity that's not welcome. With open arms into this family of God, into this new holy nation, into this priesthood of believers. But you must repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ to enter. So that's the inclusivity and the exclusivity, the exclusivity of the gospel. Now let's, let's consider the gospel and the spirit erases ethnic barriers and some of the implications for us. What we find throughout the New Testament, and especially here in Acts, is a young church that is coming of age, that is coming to this greater and greater realization uh, that the gospel and the Holy Spirit are erasing the barriers that they thought, the social barriers, the, the ethnic barriers that they had always understood were in place. And that realization is continually being translated as we go through this book of Acts. It's continually translated into a new way of thinking about uh, brothers and sisters of other ethnic backgrounds. I've said this so many times, and I'm going to say it again. I'm sure I'm going to say it more what unites us as Christians is far more central to who we are than what distinguishes us as different races or ethnicities or nationalities. What unites us is far more central to our identity. So that, as I've said a number of times, you and I, if you're a believer, you and I have more in common with a Christian yak herder in Nepal than with our unbelieving neighbor in Marshall. Now, work that out. Sure, it's easier to talk to your unbelieving neighbor than to a yak farmer in Nepal. But fundamentally, at the core of who you are, in your identity, there, you have much more in common with that Christian over there than an unbeliever here. And that's what we find in Acts 15. Luke uh, is speaking to that very reality. He, uh, in, in, we're, we're jumping from Acts 8 to Acts 15 now. 
uh, and Luke lets us listen in on a conversation that falls along these lines that I've been talking about. Paul and Barnabas have seen Gentile conversions by the thousands. Uh, some of the Judean Christians feel that, that uh, although they probably wouldn't have said it's our own prejudice, they just felt this, this resistance. Something's wrong here. There's, there's something wrong with what's happening. And, and, and they've decided what's wrong with it is, and they taught it. It says in, uh, in, in Acts 15, they start, started teaching, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, these are Christian Judean Christians who have who have confused are confused about what it means. What is this salvation by grace? Shouldn't it be Jewish? And that was an error. It's an understandable error for this transitional time, but it was an error. And Paul and Barnabas have been called in by James, who's the head of the church in Jerusalem. And they're going to give their defense. And in verse 2, it says they came and confronted this teaching with no small dissension and debate. I would not want to have been on the receiving end of that one. So James calls together the, these guys and calls together the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He convenes a meeting of the apostles and the elders that says the word elders there is presbyteros. This is basically a presbytery meeting. So we've got that right, at least. Um, Paul and Barnabas were there to present their case, and Peter also presents his case about the conversion of Cornelius, which happens in chapters 10 and 11. And, and, and they were all Gentiles. Now, the conclusion of the matter in this discussion that they have at their presbytery meeting is that salvation comes by grace through faith, but not through faith plus. Through faith alone, not faith plus. And what is the plus? Well, plus, it doesn't come by adding on to grace through faith, identification with Jewish ceremonial laws, which is what they were arguing, what they were, caring, what they were considering. And so the truth was confirmed that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, not of these keeping these laws. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to keep all of these ceremonial laws. So that was confirmed. But as you know, with human beings, when something is confirmed, the mind takes a while to catch up, right? I mean, transformation of systemic prejudice doesn't just go away like that. And not too long after this, Paul and Barnabas succumb to that rooted kind of systemic prejudice in their own minds against the Gentiles when they're, uh, it talks about it in Galatians 2 and 3, when, when, uh, when Peter is, is in, well, let me tell you how Paul, Paul who confronts it, uh, speaks of it in, in Galatians 2, verses 11 through 13. When Peter came to Antioch, Paul writes, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before... Certain men came from James, and that means from up in Jerusalem church. Before certain men came from there, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Now remember, the, the presbytery meeting has already happened. The decision has already been made. This is what's true, and here Peter is acting on his prejudice. And so Paul lets him have it. Paul lets him have it in front of everybody. It says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And then after Paul goes through this description of the event and taught, teaches the truth that corrected the wrong thinking that was there, he concludes with this in Galatians 3, verses 27 to 29. I want you to listen closely to, as I read this to hear how the gospel and the Holy Spirit erase ethnic barriers. Galatians 3, 27 to 29, this is the sort of the summary of, of Paul's uh, presentation here. It says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to promise. The gospel and the Holy Spirit erase ethnic barriers. 
And so should we. So should we. Now, the gospel and the spirit erase ethnic barriers. Here's, a, here's an implication of that. Our prejudices must be killed. Whether they're overt or subtle, and probably these days we may not even see them. They're subtle. But with, that, with, with saying that, it, it needs to be said, although it should be patently obvious, that the extreme forms of prejudice, like racism and white nationalism, have no place in the kingdom of light, and therefore no place in the church, because those ideologies are from the pit of hell. They're from the kingdom of darkness. And I don't think any of us have that struggle. I hope not, but, but we still have to deal with systemic prejudice. It doesn't go away just because you flip a switch, just because you check a box. I believe this means that we need to rigorously and fervently explore how we can unite with our ethnically different brothers and sisters in Christ in practice, not just in theory. And that will require rigorous self-examination to get to the root of our prejudice. I think it means in part that we hold our this-worldly rights loosely in the name of love, especially those with ethnically charged symbolism. As Christians, we have the right to act in self-sacrificial love. Our Lord did, and all our hope depends on that love, whereby he laid down his own rights to lift us up to the status of co-heirs with him. So let me give you an example of where that might play out, and this is my opinion, because I don't claim to be an expert and I'm, I think there needs, the conversation needs to continue. But for me, in my opinion, I've, I've dealt with this question. Is, is the Confederate flag or Confederate statue so critical to my rights that I need to fight for it? Especially when I weigh it in the light of my new identity in Christ, which translates me into a new community of love, a community in which I am a co-heir with my black brothers and sisters, and one new man with them. If that symbol is a constant reminder to them of a state-sponsored attitude of oppression, an attitude from which they as a race are still recovering, then why not seek their peace? Why not lift them up as Jesus lifted me up? Why not fight for civil rights, even a civil rights statue instead? You know, Christians of all people recognize that we take no credit whatsoever for the status and privilege we have as God's sons and daughters. Especially not by virtue of our ethnic background. So we ought to stand for the public equality of all ethnicities. At bare minimum, we ought to listen and listen well. I don't think we're listening too well. I'm not listening too well. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's scripture. And when we speak, after we've listened, when we speak, we should speak in civil tones and with understanding. Of course, we need to be wise we, as, we, as we listen and what we listen to, a lot of the angry protests that we hear is either from self-serving, one-sided manipulation of the facts, or, or worse, it's an expression of a worldly, mob-style groupthink that's rooted in utter individualism, angry rebellion, and worship of self. And those errors come from both sides of the issue. But not all the protesters are like that. I don't even think most of them are. It's just that vitriol is what makes the news. Anger makes the news. Wrath makes the news. 
Christ's followers are called to resistance when the root of the fervor is selfishness, one-sided manipulation of the facts, or anarchy, or flagrant rejection of the authorities that God has ordained, like, like uh, re rebelling against law enforcement. We're, we're, we're called as Christians of all eth ethnic backgrounds to stand our ground on what God says in his word. And it will cost us to do that from both sides of the argument. It's not going to be easy. You and I can't just decide to no longer have ethnic, ethnically uh, prejudiced tendencies. We can't just turn it off. They're systemic. They're ingrained in our psyches, often below the radar. So what we need is for them to be spotlighted, and we, then we need the help of those who are affected by them. And that's not going to be a pleasant experience quite often. And when our prejudices are, prejudices are brought into the light, they need to be mortified. They need to be killed also with the help of those who are feeling their effects. Now, the question is, do we really, do we think, do any of us think we're above all that? Oh, that was then, things have changed. Just remember from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, the apostles, even the apostles were blind to their systemic prejudices. Remember there they had neglected only the Hellenistic widows? That was a systemic prejudice. Are we better than they? The Hellenists, the Hellenists had to spotlight their prejudice and talk to them about it, and the apostles repented. The apostles changed. That's a model for us. I, uh, once sat visiting an older white couple, loved Christian people. They were good, good people. So you can imagine my surprise when during the conversation, we were talking about some community event, and almost in a whisper, she said, you know, those darkies do things differently. And she didn't even flinch. And her husband just nodded agreement. I was dumbfounded. Didn't see that coming. And I know that she knew deep down that it was wrong because she'd whispered it. But I don't think she realized how anti-Christian it was to say such a thing. How it grieves the Holy Spirit for that thought to be resident within. And I guess she had no filter. Maybe her upbringing had made the way of that thinking normal. And I need to give her grace to say she's in process. She's in process. But I think it was an expression of a still living and breathing systemic prejudice in our culture. And none of us are immune to it. So what can we do about it? We'll start with ourselves. How can I change? I need to allow my brothers and sisters in Christ who are black, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, etc., to be honest with me even when it stings. And that means I need to enter into conversation with them and allow them to be honest. I can see some of my, some of my prejudices. I can see them when they rise up. I don't like them, but some are hidden from my sight. Perhaps they're not so hidden, though, that those who feel them don't see them and can tell me about them. You know, we, we, we must all, as brothers and sisters in Christ, be about correcting each other uh, with gentleness and respect, with honor and peacemaking as our, as, as our approach, but most importantly, with love as our motivation. But we must be about helping each other. And there's no quick fix. There's no miracle cure unless God grants it. There's no, uh, no way to just turn it off. It's a long obedience in the same direction. But the gospel and the Holy Spirit erase eth ethnic barriers. So let's get busy and learn how we can live as a one family of God. Maintaining the beauty of ethnic distinctions, but seeing ourselves as one. The social chaos in our nation 
can become for us defining moments of spiritual fruit. Truly, this could be our moment. Will we rise to it? With the Spirit's help, we will. We won't get there, though, if we're angry. We won't get there if we're pugnacious, if we're demanding our rights and gnashing our, our teeth at people who disagree. Facebook and Twitter and 24-7 News are full of that kind of stuff. It's not helping. We need civil conversations in society, and we're commanded to be civil in the new society of Christ and the church. We're commanded to speak the truth in love. It's well said by Paul in Ephesians 4, 29 to 31. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for the building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. That's speaking wonderfully into our current cultural moments. As believers, this is our moment. The gospel and the spirit erase the ethnic barriers. And we are the people as we surrender to that and, and, and follow this, this, this command from God. We can make a difference. You know, in the, in the United States, white people still have the upper hand. I mean, it's just, that's just the way it is. There, there, are, there are many from other ethnicities who find that even in our, in our land of opportunity, uh, there are barriers they can't get beyond because of systemic social structures that deny them access. And for those of us, and I know that's breaking down and, that's changed, and, and you can show anecdotal places where that isn't happening anymore, but, but in, a, in a large way, they're still in place. And, and for those of us in whom the Holy Spirit dwells and reigns, we need to be willing to humble ourselves, lay down our rights in order to lift up those who are bumping into the ceiling. And what We have the right. We have the right. As Christians, we have the right to love well. With gospel-informed, Holy Spirit-directed love. The gospel and the spirit erase ethnic barriers. The book of Acts is saturated with that kind of transformation. In fact, it fills the whole New Testament. Our Lord Jesus said this in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And then he showed us what that meant so that he might lift us up. Christians of all people should take up that charge and live that way toward others with gentleness and with energy and with joy and especially with love. Think about that. Let's pray together. Father, these are tense times in our nation. But I can't help but think these are, this is a moment. This is a, a critical moment for the church. Holy Spirit, help us to be people of grace. people who understand the gospel and who submit to the Holy Spirit. Not that we ever jettison the, the, the truth that we come to God through Jesus Christ, but help us in our hearts to kill prejudice and to be people of reconciliation. Oh, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.